Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew, and I'm here with Chris Impey, who is uh, the instructor for some of the for the courses that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Um, we are happy to have you here for our astronomy live session today. So we now have three classes online. So sort of three topics that we cover. We've got astronomy, astrobiology, and history and philosophy of science. And we've gotten some good history and philosophy questions the last few weeks since that class has started. For those of you who are joining us from other areas, thank you very much for being here. Um, we hope that you uh, have fun. And if you want to check out our courses, they're available on Coursera. Um, so here is the way this works. Uh, so you post questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Vicky and I, so Vicky's behind the scenes. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Vicky and I will curate those. We try to answer them in the order that we receive them, but we tend to jump around uh, to get a variety of people and a variety of topics. So post those in the chat, we'll grab them from there and then relay them to Chris. All right, so thanks for being here. And uh, Chris, if you wanna say hello and then we'll go right into questions. Okay, welcome everyone. Yes, if you, most of our students are in the astronomy class, that's has the biggest enrollment followed by astrobiology. The history and philosophy is pretty new. It's only been up a month or so. Um, and you might want to check it out. It does cover other topics than the main astronomy course or the astrobiology course. So welcome, and the floor is open for questions on any topic. Uh, the first question is from Ben Borst, Ben Borst, switch, uh, Ben Borst, Twitch. Uh, what might dark matter be, and what might dark energy be? So dark matter and dark energy are are two enigmatic components of the universe. They amount to 95% of the universe taken together, uh, with dark energy being twice as important as dark matter, uh, where the remaining 5% are all the atoms and all the stars and galaxies, and conventional matter that we understand. Dark matter, we think, is a fundamental subatomic particle that has weak or absent interactions with electromagnetic radiation. In other words, it doesn't absorb, uh, scatter, or emit light. And that means it only can be found really by its gravitational interactions. So there's some ideas of what the particle may be, but it may and it may come from a physics experiment or high energy physics experiment. Dark energy, there's far less certainty as to what's going on. Dark energy seems to be a property of space time itself, leading to the accelerating expansion of the universe. And while there are a lot of theoretical ideas, there's really no a good lead as to what dark energy is. And it's also much harder to get a handle on. You can design astronomy experiments to diagnose dark matter and see how it's distributed and to some extent what its properties are. Dark energy appears to be uniform or constant in, over time and space. And that makes it actually very hard to pin down what it is. The next question is from Luis who sent an email. How can astronomy improve life on earth? Well, it's a good question. Astronomy is mostly about looking up and out, um, so it's not really in reflecting Earth itself. Um, I mean, there's a couple of indirect ways astronomy can improve life on Earth. Uh, one is by making us, the, our technological industrialized world civilization, aware of the value of dark skies. So humans spent most of their time when we evolved uh, until we got cities with dark skies and we were in touch with the rhythms of the sky, the night sky and the daytime sky. And astronomy can serve as an important reminder of something that's been lost actually in the modern world, which is dark sky, the ability to see the sky and experience it. It's part of our heritage. It's part of the experience of what it means to be human because it has been for thousands of years. That's probably the most tangible effect of astronomy. Another effect is that astronomy pushes the frontier of instrumentation. So astronomy observations are very difficult. They're limited by light and by the extreme faintness of the objects in the night sky. So astronomers have sort of pushed the frontier of imaging devices, both at optical and at invisible wavelengths in ways that have benefited other uses of that technology. And that's a way that perhaps astronomy is in a less obvious way benefiting us. The next question is from Wendy Trapper. Uh, can you comment on how the Kuiper belt and even the Oort cloud make our solar system unique and specifically how they might have contributed to preconditions for life on Earth? 
So the Kuiper belt, uh, we don't know. Um, the Kuiper belt exists if it exists in other solar systems, nor do we know if other solar systems have comet clouds, the Oort cloud. We speculate that since the formation process of the solar system was a sort of universal process, that it would be a reasonable to expect that other solar systems, of which we found many now, um, have small rocky bodies in their periphery, uh, the Kuiper belt and also have small rocky and icy bodies in a spherical cloud around them, representing the formation zone of the solar system. So that's just a speculation. We haven't found comets in other solar systems, nor Kuiper belt sized objects. Um, they play a role in life on Earth because these objects, the comets especially, because they plunge into the inner solar system on looping elliptical orbits, they have carried uh, organic material and in particular frozen water ice, which then becomes part of the water inventory of the earth. So their role in life on earth appears to be as the carrier of organic material and water, which is essential to life on earth. We don't know that the earth's water came primarily or singly or solely from comets. It probably came from several different sources, but comets are clearly important. The Kuiper Belt influence on life on Earth is a little more indirect, but Kuiper Belt objects do get scattered inward to Earth-crossing orbits, and so some of these large objects have been impactors in the history of life on Earth, and they possibly have disrupted a life on Earth dramatically over cosmic time. The next question is from Ravi, who um, <clears throat> has two questions about the Giant Magellan Telescope. Excuse me. Um, are there plans to use the telescope as it is being built up to do science? For example, the central mirror, one, just like one pedal mirror, secondary in an instrument? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, there's really a two-stage process. The, the central mirror on its own uh, is not really sufficient to, to push the state of the art because it's an 8.4 meter mirror. Well, we have telescopes bigger than that already. Um, however, four mirrors, uh, is, a, is a reasonable starting point. And so the first phase, Giant Magellan Telescope, will have the central uh, mirror and three of the six petals in a symmetric arrangement. Uh, and that will be a quite substantial collecting area, and it will also have the angular resolution close to the final telescope. So that's a first phase. And those four mirrors have already been done and polished, so that's, that's in hand to be able to have those, although all these construction costs are not in hand. Uh, and it probably would then be two or three years between that first phase and the full seven mirror telescope. Uh, excellent. The next question, again, about the GMT is, I read that there will be one spare eight meter pedal mirror, but no backups for the center mirror, the one with the central hole. What if something were to happen to it? Um, that's a good question. I mean, you, you sort of can't have backups for everything. I mean, with six pedal mirrors, uh, statistically, you're, you're more likely to have a failure or a problem with one of the pedals than with the central element. So if you, and, and, and it is expensive, definitely expensive and time consuming to make even one spare. So it's a conservative part of the procedure to have a spare at all, since you hope you never need it. It's just sitting there in reserve and it took a fair amount of time and cost a lot of money to make. Given that limitation, it would be unreasonable to have a spare for the central piece, though it is a different mirror, obviously. Um, and these are all extreme contingencies. There's no history in any of the world's large telescopes for mirrors having, you know, giant mirrors having broken or anything. So we don't expect that it's gonna be a problem. Um, is the backup and um, is the extra pedal mirror um, for as a you know is it a backup for um, damage or um, is it for the rotation through um, for illuminizing? No, the uh, the mirrors have to be illuminized in situ, which is where they sit. I mean, it's too expensive, person and dangerous to remove the mirror. So most of, of the very large telescopes in the world have mechanisms for re-illuminizing them where they are rather than taking them out of the mirror cell. The largest uh, telescope I know that moves its mirror uh, for re-illuminizing is a Palomar 200 inch actually, which has an illuminizing cell on the other side of the dome floor. So they have to move it all the way across the dome. 
Um, so it's it's really a spare for breakage. It's not for reilluminizing. Excellent. Uh, the next question is from Yang, who's on with us live. If space and time are fundamental for our perceptions in human lives, can there be anything fundamental other than these and matter in the universe? So physics talks about fundamental quantities, and space and time indeed are are two of the fundamental quantities in physics. And there aren't that many fundamental quantities. So apart from space and time, uh, there's obviously mass and energy, and those are interchangeable. So those are not really different things. And to be honest, uh, space and time are not entirely decoupled things because in general relativity, they are connected into a four-dimensional theoretical construct called space-time. You could say that electrical charge is another quantity, another physics quantity that could apply in astronomy, although most astronomical objects don't carry an electrical charge, they're electrically neutral. So that's probably the only other fundamental quantity. Everything else is derived from those initial quantities. So angular momentum um, and, and other things are derivatives of the fundamental quantities. Um, Sour2098 uh, says, hi, Saurabh here from India. My question is, um, is it possible that debris, that the debris or dusty material around Saturn, its rings, um, what came from moons that were disrupted or disintegrated? So the more general question is, where do the rings come from? And could they be broken up moons? Um, the best guess is actually that they're failed moons rather than broken up moons. Um, so Saturn obviously has a lot of moons. I think if you go down to the smallest, the number is close to 80. I think it's hard to know the exact number. Maybe upper 70s is the actual number. Um, and those go down to quite small objects. Um, and then there's all the ring particles. Um, so it seems like if you sweep up the ring particles, oh, they look impressive. Uh, they don't amount to anything close to the mass of the largest Saturn moon, an object like Titan. So these are very small, uh, very small amounts of mass, even all taken together. Uh, there probably were moons that got destroyed in the formation process, but most of that material was in unstable orbits and probably dissipated a long time ago. Uh, the next question is from Wendy. Has the force of gravity been constant in intensity throughout cosmological evolution? That's a good question because the experiments to show whether or not the gravitational constant, which is a fundamental constant of physics, has changed are quite subtle and difficult to do. But people have tried to ascertain whether looking back in time, which is to say out in space, there's any evidence that the gravitational constant has changed. And the only real way it would manifest would be by very different behavior of objects in their orbits or in their trajectories uh, in the distant universe. And we have not seen any evidence of this, but it's not a very sensitive test. So if the gravitational constant had changed by very small amounts over cosmic time, I'm not sure we'd be able to measure it with an astronomy uh, measurement. Um, Mountain of Pillows is on with us live and asks, uh, JWST recently discovered galaxies that existed just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. Are there explanations for how they could form this early? So there's been a little uh, controversy or uh, flurry in the literature of the idea that JWST's discovery of distant and high redshift galaxies have somehow broken cosmology, that they've created a situation where there's no way the standard model of cosmology can accommodate the formation of galaxies that early. That's not actually the case. I think the current situation is that cosmology is not in trouble. However, it is challenged because some of these high redshift galaxies, the ones found in the last few months by JWST, are very massive. So the trick is not forming any galaxy at all 200 million years after the Big Bang. That's totally reasonable. Uh, natural gravitational forces and slow accretion of matter can do that. But forming a massive galaxy is definitely challenging. But they're also very rare objects. We have to remember that when JWST finds these extreme high redshift galaxies, they could be unique in that volume of space. In other words, they, they could represent rare fluctuations of density in the early universe that happen to lead in a particular place to an early formation of a massive object. So no single high redshift galaxy or even handful of them is going to 
really uh, be an affrontal assault, if you like, on cosmology. So at the moment, I think we do understand how these high edge of galaxies can form. And it would only be a problem if we found galaxies going back much further towards the Big Bang, like within 50 million years of the Big Bang. Uh, the next question is from Paul B. Considering the huge expense and difficulty of manned missions to Mars, would it be better just to concentrate resources on better robotic methods? Or do you believe there is something particularly special about physically sending humans there? Uh, it's an important debate and it's being had in space and planetary science communities. NASA's of course having this debate internally because the cost of a human mission to Mars is enormous. It's difficult, dangerous, and extremely expensive. And we just know having had robots on Mars uh, for since the mid 1990s, so almost 30 years, that the robots, the little robotic probes and rovers do better. They do very well. They cost a lot less. They're fairly sturdy. Many of them have outlived their original design specs by a long time. Um, so NASA knows how to make these robotic probes and they do very well. So if, if there were no other consideration, then that's the best way to explore Mars. However, there is some drive from the public, in fact, or certainly from the commercial space sector, uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk's organizations in particular, to send humans out there to have us be part of this adventure. Uh, and there's sort of intangibles wrapped up in that idea. Uh, it's our, some romantic vision of us leaving the earth and being adventurers in a new frontier. Uh, it's not alone enough to justify it, and NASA really will take a long timeline to do this if they work on their own. But the private sector might accelerate the time scale if they invest all the wealth that those two people, the richest people on the planet, have into getting there in the next decade, say. Uh, the next question is, <clears throat> excuse me, is from um, our Halcyon Days, who's on with us live. Could you explain how we estimate the radius of neutron stars? Yes, neutron star radius is estimated from a model, actually. We, we don't have direct measurement of the size of neutron stars because they're only a couple of kilometers and they're the distances of hundreds or thousands of trillions of miles, even the nearest one. So there's no way a telescope can resolve them. Also, we don't see neutron stars directly anyway because they're dark. Uh, the only thing we see is the subset of neutron stars with hotspots, which are pulsars. So basically, the estimate of the size of a neutron star comes from the measurement of its mass. So we do have the mass measurement of neutron stars and our knowledge of how a neutron star forms, which tells us what the equilibrium size would be of a star of a particular mass that dies by collapse and leaves behind pure neutron material. So it's an estimate. Um, the next question is, given quantum uncertainty is a fundamental part of the universe and that the billions of worlds created all devoid of life, do this, does this lend any credence to the idea that life on Earth may be a fluke? We don't know whether or not all the worlds that we're finding out in space, exoplanets, are, are inhabited. We know that many of them are habitable, so in principle they could host biology. I think the only way we'll be able to decide that something unusual or flukish happened on the Earth was if we inspected maybe a few dozen of the most habitable Earth-like planets and found no signs of microbial life on any of them. That would indicate with some degree of certainty that the Earth is unusual, that there were special conditions on the Earth. At the moment, I don't think we can say anything, however. The, the research is just too early in its phase. Sauer2098 asks, uh, could you please comment on wolf rayet stars and luminous blue variables? Are there any common characteristics that they share? Um, yes, wolf ray stars are um, a kind of advanced stage of stellar evolution uh, for massive stars where there's, there's a high degree of instability. Massive stars at the end of their lives go through a lot of instability as as they go up the fusion chain and extend to more heavy nuclear fuels. Um, each time they run out of a nuclear fuel, they reconfigure, they become unstable, they lose mass, and they can sometimes go into oscillation and become variable, either regularly or in an irregular pattern. Um, 
And so both the wolf rays and blue variable stars are in this category. Uh, they're interesting because they tell us about the late stage of stellar evolution. They tell us about how a star behaves near the end of its life. Uh, the next question is um, from email. When a planetary system coalesces from a solar nebula, doesn't the entropy decrease and thus violate the second law of thermodynamics? Um, the entropy of a planetary system or something that forms planets uh, it does indeed seem to decrease because you go from a sort of more disorganized state to a more organized state because you form planets. Uh, but you have to actually track the whole entropy in the system because the, um, the, the cloud is also um, collapsing. It's also changing its angular momentum and its energy. And it's not clear that the overall entropy of the, the whole system is actually changing substantially at all. Energy is being redistributed. Entropy is being redistributed too because at some point you form a star and the planets and a lot of debris left over, and you have to track the entropy in all of those components. The next question is from uh, Jorge, who sent an email. Uh, Hello, Professor. Th thank you for your excellent course. You described the Antikythera device. While the information of dates, planetary displacements, and timekeeping was possible through observations, the technology required to manufacture such a device seems to exceed in complexity any other similar artifact of that time. Um, can you please elaborate on this subject and talk about, you know, if there are other discoveries or other kind of technologies that, um, you know, inform us about uh, where it fit in history? So well, the Antikythera device was an amazing discovery. Um, it, it was found in a ship off in the Aegean Sea. Um, it was a Greek ship or a Roman ship that went down. Uh, and this became a rusted object on the sea bottom. It's an analog computer. It consists of, I think, 47 different gears. They're off-centered gears. They're exquisite mechanical mechanisms to track the nonlinear motions of all the planets, to predict eclipses, and to keep time. Uh, so it's an extraordinary device. And people, for a while, thought it was a one-off. It was unique because we've still never found anything like it. Um, so it's always challenging when you find an object like this that was sort of rewritten the book on the history of engineering because nobody knew such an object would be produced. There was no mass production of, of gears, metal gears, and mechanical components like this. So all of these things, the, all the pieces of this device must have been made by hand. And it was obviously a showpiece, uh, and a piece that was probably carried around on a boat just to impress people in a foreign port or a foreign country. Uh, the prelude to doing trade with them. So at the moment, yes, it seems to be unique. No one since has found other objects like this. It probably came from a design uh, done by Archimedes, who was one of the most brilliant mechanical minds of antiquity. Um, but it's for manufacture, how it was manufactured is really unknown. It just by inference, it must have been created painstakingly by hand. Well, the next question is from uh, Cap V75, who's on with us live. We'd like to know what is the next, or what is next for space telescopes after the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, um, it takes so long to make these expensive, difficult projects. James Webb, of course, was initially conceived of over 30 years ago was much delayed and much over budget when it was launched. So you really have to work ahead. And indeed, even as James Webb starts its work, astronomers with their decadal survey were working on what the next telescopes in space might be or ground or ground-based telescopes. And in space there's several concepts. There's there's a there's a mission called LUVOIR, which is really its acronym, L-U-V-O-I-R. And it's a large, it's another sort of large space telescope. With, an even, with a much bigger field of view than James Webb, which has a very small field of view. And it's one, of course, that will work in the visible and ultraviolet, which is not accessible so for the most part to James Webb. It's working in the near infrared. So that's a worthy successor to James Webb to work at a, uh, at a shorter wavelength range unavailable to James Webb. Um, there's also an origins telescope, 
which is planned by NASA. And this is one that would characterize Earth-like worlds and really be able to detect life on them by the alteration of their atmospheres and maybe even by uh, their topography and the fact they have continents and oceans. Um, and then another great observatory that NASA is planning for the future is called the Lynx X-ray Observatory. And it's a successor to the Chandra Observatory, which has been doing amazing work for two decades now. So these are three missions that NASA is considering. Each of them on their own will cost three to five to who knows how many billions of dollars. And it's unlikely NASA will be able to do all three in the next decade. The next question is from A1 Bravo, uh, who would like to know, what is a redshift? A redshift is the stretching of light caused by the expansion of the universe as light travels through space. Um, and so it is what it sounds like. It's a shift of the wavelength of light to longer wavelengths, lower energies, redder colors. And for in the history of cosmology in the early 20th century, the redshift was measured for galaxies. And this was the key to discovering that galaxies were remote systems of stars and that the universe was expanding. And so in this case, you make a spectrum, you smear the light of a galaxy out, and you look for the wavelengths of the spectral features of hydrogen, helium, carbon, and other elements. And what you see for a distant galaxy is those wavelengths are shifted to longer wavelengths compared to a nearby object or, the, or something in the lab. Uh, and that redshift, that shifting, is reflecting the expansion of the universe. You can also interpret it as a recession velocity, uh, a speed with which the object is moving away from us. That's another way of framing the redshift. The next question is from Camilla, who's on with us live. My question is, in your opinion, will we ever see past the event horizon of a black hole? I mean, according to the theory, um, it is an information barrier or membrane. So the theory of black holes says that you can't see beyond the black hole, uh, beyond the event horizon. Um, some versions of the theory of black holes imply that as information falls towards the event horizon, it actually uh, imprints on the event horizon. This is called the holographic theory of black holes. And so while showing us what's inside the black hole beyond the event horizon, it means the event horizon may actually it had carry with it information that we can somehow extract. That would be very exciting if we could read the event horizon of a black hole some way in the way that we can read a hologram for the information originally, originally encoded there. But nobody's actually figured out a practical way to do that yet. Um, David Mack um, uh, sent an email and I'd like to know, after we establish a base on Mars, what do you believe is our next best step for human exploration of our solar system? I think with Mars as an enormous challenge that itself is going to take probably a couple of decades, I think the next actual thing to do is, is, is much closer to home. It's to use a, a sort of moon orbit or Earth moon orbit uh, to start to build substantial structures and then be able to navigate through the solar system. So if you want to explore the solar system, the rest of the solar system, the outer solar system, well beyond Mars, the giant planets and their moons, you need a way to make things in orbit. You can't just build things on the Earth and lift them through the Earth's gravity. It's too expensive, too difficult. So you need to be able to construct your next set of exploring missions from space in a zero gravity environment. And the best most cost-effective way to do that is to have a moon base, not a Mars base, but a moon base, and to manufacture things on the moon's surface, bring them into orbit, and then also use 3D printing methods and other methods to build things in moon orbit, and then send them off through the solar system for much lower energy cost than launching something from the Earth. Um, Iblin9 asks, uh, Greetings, Professor Impey. We have seen a few images of Titan's surface recently by JWST and Professor Sarah Horst. Could the professor, or could you say a few words? How do they see through its dense atmosphere and how much more do we know about Titan now? We know a fair amount more. Um, of course, Titan is, since the Cassini mission sunsetted, we don't have anything actively out there in the Saturnian system looking at Titan. Cassini made a number of close flybys of Titan, and that's our best information we've had so far. 
making observations from the earth or from orbiting telescopes is just far this far inferior they just don't have a detailed resolution how we see through the thick atmosphere um, is either using infrared methods sometimes or actually better radar so we can look through the dense atmosphere with radar and we can see what the topography is that way and so we've mapped out titan pretty pretty well um, the next question is from H. Bin Biham, who asks, do you anticipate a time when AI, artificial intelligence, might start taking the lead in thought about the cosmos and the origin of biological life? So AI is impacting astronomy um, already very strongly, as it is every other scientific field. Um, in terms of its impact on the frontier of, say, astrobiology, that's a good question. I think AI is eventually going to come into play in terms of doing hypothetical experiments as to how life might have started in somewhat different circumstances. So we have a lot of habitable planets. Some are quite Earth-like, but they're not going to be exactly Earth-like. Their physical conditions and their chemical conditions and compositions will be slightly different. And AI methods will probably be very good at sort of running through the possibilities and running models by varying parameters and maybe guessing or estimating what type of variation of properties of an exoplanet might be conducive to biology. Uh, the next question is from Sarab, who's on with us live. What is the future of exoplanet atmospheric study and what are the constraints one needs to consider while studying the atmosphere of an exoplanet? So the future of exoplanet atmosphere study, I mean, it's, it's a very important field and James Webb will do as much as it can of it. It's unlikely to be able to look at more than half dozen or so super Earths. Um, it, it's just a very difficult experiment, even for James Webb, which was not built for that experiment, of course. It was conceived before exoplanets were discovered. The ground-based telescopes that are under construction now, the three, the ELT of the Europeans, 39 meter telescope, the um, 30 meter telescope of, of Caltech and the University of California, the TMT, and then the GMT, a 24 and a half meter telescope we're building in Chile. These were the telescopes that who can do the experiment of sniffing an atmosphere, taking a spectrum of an atmosphere of an Earth-like planet and looking for life. So that experiment will be done by all those three telescopes as soon as they come online. In terms of the other, the, the longer future of that work, it needs a new space facility to do it. Hubble will be, is tapped out essentially, and it's near the end of its life. And James Webb is, just doesn't have a lot of spectral range in the infrared, and so it can only do a limited amount of this work. Uh, but that work is, is clearly going to continue, and it's probably the way that life beyond Earth will first be discovered. Um, Joel Belletti sent an email, and I find this question to be pretty fun. Um, the age of the universe, galaxies, et cetera, is spoken in terms of years. How can the time taken for the Earth to revolve around the sun be used for measuring the age of the universe, et cetera? Or does year mean something different when referring to the age of the universe, for example? I mean, that's a good question. And it, so it is, it is not a very logical unit to use years. It's, it's a very human unit though. And so astronomers use years to define long time scales. Uh, but the truth is that the fundamental unit in physics and in astronomy is a second. And second is now defined in sort of international units as being the number of vibrations, I think, of a cesium atom. It's a particular atom where you uh, know the frequency of its natural vibration and you decide how many of those oscillations occur in a second and that's how you define a second and a year is roughly uh, 10 million seconds and so a year is just derived from the fundamental unit which is a second but it's just a more familiar unit for us to use you could talk in terms of seconds which do have a physical definition but then the numbers you'd be dealing with are, are too large because they'd be 10 million times the numbers we're used to. So instead of 10 billion years, you'd be talking about 10 billion times 10 million seconds, which is a rather unpleasantly large number. The next question is from email. Are cosmologists able to demarcate um, time frames for when the cosmic microwave background was in each part of the electromagnetic spectrum from 300 million years ago until today? 
Uh, yes, because we know the cosmic expansion history of the universe. So the microwave radiation that we see with radio telescopes was emitted uh, roughly 360,000 years after the Big Bang. And that was at a redshift of roughly 1,000. So the universe was 1,000 times smaller and hotter than it is now. And from that point to this point, we have a cosmological model where you feed in the amount of dark matter, normal matter, and dark energy. And you can predict uh, how the temperature of the universe has changed since then and how the redshift has evolved since then. So yes, at every point in cosmic time between 360,000 years after the Big Bang till now, 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang, you can say what the median wavelength of the, that radiation would have been. And it's just gradually migrated from sort of red optical wavelengths at the time we see those images from microwave satellites to the microwaves we observe around us today. Uh, the next question is from Poikui29, who asks, what causes the different forms of water ice and how do we detect them on other planets? So there are many kinds of water ice. Um, most people are unfamiliar with the fact that there's, I think, 15 different crystalline forms of ice. Uh, and that's just because uh, depending on the pressures, especially a function of pressure, depending on the pressure, uh, ice can take a variety of forms. I think the time, the kind we're familiar with is called ice nine actually in the sequence, uh, but there are other forms that are quite bizarre. There's even a, a high pressure two-dimensional form of ice where it literally forms uh, two-dimensional sheets rather than sort of three-dimensional crystals that we're familiar with. So it's physical conditions that decide what kind of ice uh, you get. And we do know places in the universe where some of those other forms of ice might be found. And they are typically deep in the deep in the planetary atmospheres of, of gas giant planets or ice giant planets, as they're called. Uh, the next question is from <clears throat> Steve Callender, who asks, do we know what the smallest amount of matter needed for a star to ignite and how much gravity cause, uh, cause pressure is needed to ignite a star? Yes, it's a, not a, a hard number, a very, very precise number, but basically 7% of the mass of the sun, if you go down from the mass, sun, the mass of the sun to 7%, uh, you end up with a hot ball of gas where the interior temperature is just sufficient to do the first step in the fusion chain. So the central temperature, when it gets to a few million Kelvin, you can turn hydrogen into deuterium. Uh, and it's, so it's called deuterium burning or deuterium fusion in a, in a star. Um, and if that's all the mass you have, it doesn't actually progress beyond that. So you don't actually get the three stage process that leads to helium that takes a higher temperature. So that's the, that's the threshold for fusion in a star, in any star. And it's a, a rather feeble nuclear process that's nothing like the process that leads to the sun uh, radiating light. Um, so Rob would like to know, hypothetically, if our moon were as dense as a neutron star, what would happen or what would have happened? Well, if the, new, if the moon were its current size and as dense as a neutron star, it would, of course, have a mass trillions of times more than the mass it has, and that would be untenable. So that's almost an unrealistic situation. If you're asking what the state of the moon would have to be for it to be equivalent to a neutron star, then it would compress to a, to a very small amount. So uh, I can't do that math in my head, but I suspect that uh, the Earth would, for example, have to compress to about three centimeters in diameter to meet the definition of a black hole. If it were maybe three, four times bigger than that, um, 10, 12, 15 centimeters, the Earth would be a neutron star. The moon is a quarter of the mass of the Earth. And so basically, you'd have to squash the Earth to something like a few centimeters for it to be a neutron star. And that isn't going to happen in any, wor any world that we're familiar with. Uh, the next question is from Azam, um, who sent an email. I was explaining special relativity to someone, and they asked, doesn't that mean that the universe is older than it appears? Given the speed of light, the expansion of the universe, and the effects of time dilation, most of the most distant objects, stars, and galaxies are probably gone, already too far away to see and not existent. Um, uh, 
let's see, uh, can you talk about uh, whether his view is correct? So there's an element of truth to that. It, it is indeed true that when we see the most distant objects, we're looking back in time and we're looking out a very large distance, maybe 35, 40 billion light years. And in the 13 billion years of time that light from distant objects could have traveled to us, those objects, uh, of course, have evolved. So we don't know what they look like now, we just see what they look like long ago in the young universe. And so, yes, it is indeed true that some of the distant objects we see might no longer exist. And if it's a galaxy, it's not probably going to disappear, but it certainly could have faded to darkness as all the stars died, uh, or could have been disrupted by other galaxies and so on, or could have suffered some evaporation process and lost a lot of its stars. So yes, we don't know. So there, there are things we don't know about because we can only see objects as they were rather than as they are. The next question is from an email. How can the interaction between electrons and photons during the opaque era be explained as the photon doesn't carry a charge? The photon doesn't carry a charge, but it's an electromagnetic wave. And so it has varying electric and magnetic fields that are coupled. And because of that, the varying electric field that's part of electromagnetic radiation does couple to the electric field of a negatively charged electron. And when you do that calculation, so it's a fairly simple physics calculation, you induce, you deduce that electron scattering of photons is actually a very efficient process and a very important process. And so when there are free electrons in a plasma, as there were in the early universe, they're extremely effective at scattering light. And that's why light doesn't travel through the infant universe. Only when those uh, electrons have joined with protons to form stable hydrogen atoms is that electrical charge taken out of the situation and then the light can travel freely and we see the universe as transparent after that time. Uh, the next question is from Victor who's on with us live. In your opinion, what are some of the most important publications, books or papers ever written in the field of astronomy? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, you have to almost go back in time for some of these. Um, one of the most important books, it's a 47-volume encyclopedia, is called The Almagest uh, by Claudius Ptolemy in the first century AD. And it was the summation of all of astronomy, star catalogs, motions of planets, motions of stars of antiquity. So it's, it's the sort of summation of astronomy uh, as we knew it 2,000 years ago, and it's an amazingly important book. If you fast forward to the Copernican time, obviously the Revolutionibus, the Latin name for Copernicus's book on the revolutions, which presented the heliocentric model for the first time, is one of the most important books in, in the history of astronomy. Uh, and then there are others. And then maybe you move forward into the 20th century with the paper written by Edwin Hubble that measured the distance to M31 and showed that the Andromeda Nebula was a distant galaxy. And then his 1929 paper that showed that galaxies are redshifted and the redshift is proportional to their distance. And that was the evidence, although he didn't use the term, for the expanding universe. So those are some obvious landmark papers. And if you want to pick one from the modern era, you would probably have to say that the first detection of gravitational waves uh, in 2016, published in 2017, is a, is a landmark paper. Uh, the next question is from Wendy, who sent an email. Do you think terraform terraforming Mars or another world could ever result in living there as we do on Earth? I think it's very unlikely. Mars is not very habitable now. It's a frozen desert, arid world with a very thin atmosphere. So the process of heating up the planet sufficiently to release carbon dioxide uh, and generate a greenhouse effect and hope that it runs away at some level and then warms the planet further enough for liquid water to exist because it's frozen under the surface and you need it more liquid on the surface and then build up an atmosphere from there. You have to oxygenate the atmosphere, which is yet another step. All those steps uh, are incredibly time consuming and expensive. So it's just not likely we're ever gonna do that. 
and there's nowhere really else in the solar system we could conceivably live or that we could alter to be habitable. Mars is as close as it gets and it's obviously extremely challenging. Um, another email question is, uh, is there a correlation between dark energy and the forward flow of time? We don't know what dark energy does to time. It seems to be a property of space-time itself. It seems to be a sort of uh, a component of space-time that has a negative pressure that leads to the accelerating expansion of the universe. Um, there's no obvious experiment in astronomy by which we can determine whether dark energy has an effect on time. All we can do is measure the effect of dark energy in terms of how it changes the distance between objects over time, the accelerating expansion of the universe, basically. So uh, you could speculate, if we knew the physical mechanism of dark energy, then we'd be in a better position to talk about its effect on time and maybe doing an experiment to measure that. Uh, the next question um, is, uh, if the Higgs field is ubiquitous in the universe, wouldn't gravitons as the force carrier of gravity have to interact with the Higgs field? And if so, does this um, imbue mass to gravity? So I guess they're asking, does this imply that gravity itself has mass? I and mean, that's a good question. Um, remember that the graviton is a construct of the standard model of particle physics. Um, it's never been observed, so we haven't, and, and it's hypothesized to be the exchange particle or the particle that carries gravity, just like a photon carries the electromagnetic force. Um, so it's a hypothetical particle and it's not been observed. Um, and it is true that since the Higgs is the field that generates mass, mass in standard particle physics would have to be attributed for all mechanisms through the Higgs. So yes, the graviton uh, would be the carrier of mass and it would get its ability to do that from the Higgs field. Um, but at the moment, our theory is incomplete. So gravity is not part of the standard model of particle physics. So I don't think we can talk about how it connects to the Higgs particle, which is the final piece of the standard model of particle physics. Um, so we've talked about dark energy and dark matter a little bit. Can you explain um, the difference between the two? So what is dark matter G with the, or what's the difference between dark matter and dark energy? Well, the phrases sound similar, but they're really very different. So just to keep it short, dark matter is a ubiquitous mass component of the universe present on all scales um, that exceeds normal matter, the stuff we're made of, and all stars and galaxies are made of by a factor of six. Uh, and holds galaxies together. It is present in intergalactic space too, and it, and it obviously feels only the force of gravity it's because it doesn't shine. That's why it's dark. Um, dark energy is much less clear what it is. Dark energy, as far as we know, only makes itself known through the accelerating expansion of the universe. So it appears to be some entity, it's hard to know what to call it, uh, that is a function of space-time itself, uh, of the vacuum, if you like, and that leads to accelerating space-time expansion. And really, apart from that, we know almost nothing else about dark energy. Uh, the next question is from um, Stephen GMS, who's on with this live, who asks, um, I understood the speed of light to be constant, but have now learned that it does vary when passing through galactic dust for example. Does this variation make for another astronomical measurement tool? Well, speed of light it doesn't necessarily vary so much by passing through galactic dust, but, the, but light interacts with dust, uh, scatters off it, can be absorbed and re-emitted, and, that, and that's what really affects the passage of light through dust. It's not that the speed of light per se or, or it in, intrinsically is changing. Um, light really only changes its speed in a, in a medium of some kind. And dust, dust is not really a medium, like a liquid or a gaseous medium, light will change its speed. So it's really just the fact that light is interacting with dust that is the effect, not the change in the speed. Um, the next question is from one of our live 
uh, participants is the concept of a black hole singularity in conflict with quantum theory? Um, black holes have elements of to them that are in conflict with quantum theory, in particular the uh, the problem of the event horizon and the fact that Hawking radiation is supposed to exist, that creates a conflict with uh, quantum theory because quantum processes are supposed to be reversible in time and across space, and that's clearly not true at the event horizon. Um, the singularity itself uh, may or may not be a conflict with uh, quantum theory because we simply don't know enough about the, the singularities. Uh, Stephen Hawking and um, Roger Penrose developed a set of singularity theorems in the late 1970s, uh, and they sort of describe what we know, the little that we do know about singularities, and you don't, there's no obvious conflict with quantum theory in their formulation. Uh, the next question is from Iblin9. NASA's eyes um, show many alarming um, signs of atmosphere buildup of CO2 and you know uh, carbon monoxide in real time and temperature, um, yet people still don't look up. Do you think there's a way to draw attention to the upcoming climate catastrophe by means of astronomy? Well, it would be nice if if there were a way of doing that. Um, I think you know when you look up in astronomy, the degradation of the sky that you see is from light pollution and, and atmospheric contaminants. And so some of those are implicated uh, with climate change, but um, carbon dioxide itself as an ingredient in the atmosphere that's causing um, so the greenhouse effect and warming is, is transparent. And so astronomy and astronomers and telescopes just see straight through it. Uh, so it's really the particulates that um, astronomers can measure through their observations. And those are important too, because the pollution that goes with climate change is also really impacting the biosphere. Uh, the next question is from uh, Anhe, who's on with us live. Um, what reading materials would you recommend for someone who wants to start to learn about astronomy and physics? Well, if you're talking about really starting at the at the basic undergraduate level. I mean, I think you can start with pop, popular books, trade books about physics or astronomy that are non-technical, not with equations, not with math, because you can learn a lot about these subjects just conceptually from a well-written book. You don't need the math or the full formalism of calculus to be able to study physics or astronomy. So I would just start with some of the, the best known trade books about these subjects. Um, the next question is from Del K8. Uh, simply as a thought experiment, has a space-based telescope being placed outside the heliosphere been discussed or conceived? And would it theoretically be capable of transmitting large quantities of data back to Earth, um, similar to the data stream that JWST sends? Yes, I think that as a thought experiment or as a design study, uh, NASA has considered the telescopes outside the heliosphere they're very distant telescopes that are immune from the earth's radiation environment and the even the sun's radiation environment so they've definitely been conceived of they're very expensive missions like james webb difficult to fix because they're too far away and and so you know james webb was the big telescope of the decade essentially and it was delayed a whole decade too so it's really usurped the last two decades of planning by astronomers so I don't think any of these more visionary distant telescopes have got much of a look in right now. They're gonna be decades off. Excellent. All right, it's uh, 10.54. We have time for just a few more questions. So make sure you post those in the chat. Um, we probably have time for, uh, depending on how long they take, you know, three or four more. Uh, Astronomy in my, is my world um, asks, if we find extraterrestrial beings, what will we do? Well, it depends on how we find them and what they're like. Um, I mean, it will be an earth-changing event if we find extraterrestrial beings, by which I mean advanced creatures rather than microbes. Where microbes may not be a life-changing event for most people on the earth. Uh, I think our biggest uncertainty and decision is gonna be, can we communicate with them? If we decide they're sentient or intelligent, uh, they're obviously not going to speak our language or any of our earth languages. 
So how do we communicate with them? That's the biggest question. How do we set up a protocol? And the other thing we're going to have to do is decide whether they are benign or malign. Um, there's obviously concern expressed by Hawking and others that if we meet intelligence of a certain capacity, it might be have bad intentions towards us. And we want to discern that as soon as possible. Um, the next question is from Eklesik, or Eklekik, um, who asks, uh, what role is AI currently playing in astronomy and what tools are being implemented? So AI has been used in a, in a variety of ways. It's definitely being used in sort of object detection and discovery mode. So astronomers deal with large data sets, large imaging data sets, messy data with noise and artifacts and so on. And AI methods are very good at being able to sig filter signals, weak signals, patterns out of data that's noisy or imperfect or incomplete. So those methods are being used heavily in cosmology and surveys of galaxies, of stars, all, all sorts of surveys in astronomy. Um, AI methods are also starting to be used uh, to do better simulations, to improve the way we calculate an astrophysical simulation which parts of the physics are important to get exactly right and which parts are not so important to get exactly right, where we can make an approximation. Uh, these decision spaces are now being done with machine learning, which is really quite interesting. So those are the two ways that I'm aware of that are, that are very definitely having a big impact right now. Uh, the next question is from Nadia Sapotovic, um, who's on with us live and asks, um, around a planet, or on a planet orbiting a, an orange dwarf star, would we be able to see anything? Um, would, wouldn't everything be in, uh, in the infrared? If we were on an Earth-like planet, hypothetically orbiting a, a red dwarf or an orange dwarf star, uh, and, and those planets do exist, there are a number of Earths going to be orbiting such stars, um, our, our star would obviously be dim. We'd be quite close to it, however, because uh, to get the radiation sufficient to be habitable from a dim star, you have to be quite close to it, much closer than we are to the sun. So we would see that scar, star hanging probably like a blood red orange in the sky. And, and yes, the world we lived in would be very dim and glow dull red from the red light because there would be no visible light coming from a star that cool. Uh, so sensory... Our senses would be different because they'd be tuned to infrared radiation rather than visible radiation. Um, uh, Hope Odero asks, um, staring at the quantum information era, shouldn't astrophysicists be more excited about the prospects, prospects that generative AI has for transferring learning to understand the universe better in hard to understand areas? I mean, are the prospects for training an AI to actually think and help us understand the universe there? I mean, right now you said we were using it for data analysis, but uh, you know, beyond that, uh, yeah. are there any speculations? Yeah, the more ambitious possible roles of AI are, are up for debate and people are arguing about them. I think where people would draw the line, most scientists and even most computer scientists, is they don't think AIs are ready yet to develop new theories and new ideas about the universe from scratch, ab initio, without any guidance from humans. Uh, they can take the information we know about the universe and maybe solve some problems for us. But that open-ended, out-of-the-box thinking that leads to new theories of the kind that Einstein did to come up with general relativity, there's no indication yet that AIs are, are up to that task. So there are things that AIs will do as our servants, you know, working alongside the human brain of an astronomer. And there are things that they're not yet able to do in astronomy or any field. All right. Um, this is going to be our final question for today. And um, for those of you who are on now, um, if you've got time, stick around because we are going to transition right into our astronomy news stream uh, with Michael and Vicky. Um, so Chris, but for us, the last question is from one of our live viewers. Taking into account the Kardashev scale, do you think humanity will be able to reach an advanced enough level of civilization to be able to construct 
hypothetical concepts such as the Dyson sphere within a reasonable amount of time. Of course, I don't know what reasonable means, but. Right. So I, we are very primitive in the Kardashev scale. So just to recap, the Nikolai Kardashev was a visionary Russian astronomer theorist uh, from about 100 years ago, I think. And he developed the idea of advanced civilizations on a four point scale, he used Roman numerals for this. A, a, a Kardashev level zero civilization harnesses, harnesses uh, the energy of their entire star. Uh, a level, sorry, zero harnesses just the energy associated with their planet. So what their planet gets from a star, level one gets their whole star, level two gets their whole galaxy and level three gets the whole universe. Well, we're obviously incredibly far from any of those. We're, we're a Kardashev half civilization, as some people have said it, because we do harness almost the capacity of our Earth and we have the ability to gather energy from space. Uh, but developing the energy of our entire star, which would be a Dyson sphere, trapping the radiation of our star, and that would take us to the next level up in the Kardashev scale, uh, that is very far beyond our technology. Um, we at the moment intercept about a billionth of the sun's radiation and we don't use that billionth very efficiently at all. So that's how far we are. We're in the tiny little foothills uh, where the mountaintop would be a Dyson sphere and the next level up of Kardashev civilization. How long would it take to get there? Very hard to tell, but it looks to me like hundreds of years and not decades. That was an interesting one to finish with. So thanks for the range as always from astrobiology to cosmology and everything in between. Um, thanks to Matthew and Vicky for running the session. And as you know, you can go off and hear some good astronomy news now, and then we'll see you again, I think in two weeks. Excellent, that is true. We will be here again, not here. We will be on again in two weeks um, on YouTube, uh, streaming through our YouTube channel. And we can post a link, maybe Vicky can post a link there. We hope you all have a great rest of your day or evening. And we will see you again um, in the future. Take care, everyone.